Well, welcome back to our sixth and final installment of our introduction video series to my new book, The Art of Revelation. And uh, thank you for joining us all this way through. And uh, at this point, with one last, one last thing I'm going to share, Every, everybody I've ever seen try to write about or teach on the book of Revelation, there's always uh, this, this statement where they say, well, the book of Revelation is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, that's exactly what Revelation 1-1 says, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants much must soon take place. So this whole concept of the revelation, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, it's interesting because after they say it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, they go on and they talk about the destruction of planet Earth, the arising Antichrist, the one world government, the, the apostate religious system that's become the harlot. And they, they go on and they go in different directions, but it still doesn't seem to reveal Jesus Christ. So why is this book about Jesus Christ? Or is it really about Jesus Christ? So let's back up for a minute and think about this. I want to show you something you may have never seen, but there's a word in the New Testament that, that uses this word revelation or revealing. In the Greek, it's this word apocalypsis. We'll look at that in a minute, but it means to unveil. So it's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Now, as we do a study of apocalypsis and you look through, you'll find these five references in the New Testament from the authors of the New Testament saying that they were waiting for the unveiling of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read these to you, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, talking about trials, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed or unveiled, when Jesus Christ is revealed. Then he says in the next few verses later, in 1 Peter 1, verse 13, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in his, at his coming. Now, I don't believe he's saying at the second coming, at the end of world history, he's talking about the coming, that Jesus referred to as his coming to bring vengeance, destruction, to bring uh, the, the destruction of 70 AD that he talks about in Matthew 24. So here it says the set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is unveiled, when he is revealed at his coming in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Then we have 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 and 7. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. Now, let's keep that in context. He'll pay back trouble to those who trouble you. In the first century, those who troubled them were the Jewish religious leaders of the temple. He's saying God will come back to bring the trouble on those that are troubling you, the early first century Christians. He's not talking to you who's reading this 2,000 years later. He's not saying he's going to vindicate you. He's, he's saying to you, those reading this in the first century, he'll come back to vindicate you from those who are troubling you. So he goes on to say this. This will happen, the vindication of those who are troubling you. He'll trouble them. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in power, in blazing fire with his powerful angels. When is it going to happen? It's going to happen when Jesus is unveiled, when he is apocalypsis. When that apocalypsis unveiling happens, that's when they, the Jewish leaders will be paid back for the persecution of the early first century church. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7, Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed or unveiled or apocalypsis. You're waiting and they're eagerly waiting for Jesus Christ to be unveiled. And lastly, Romans chapter 2 verse 5, 
But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be unveiled, will be revealed, will be apocalypsis. His judgment will be unveiled. Now, this, these five here, these revealing of Jesus passages, they're pointing to something that they're eagerly waiting for. It's coming around the bend. It's coming soon. Jesus will be unveiled. So he'll be apocalypsis. Jesus needs to be revealed. Apocalypsis means to unveil. So the question is, what was veiling Jesus? Wouldn't they have already been unveiled at the cross, or the resurrection, or the ascension, or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Acts 2? Why is he still veiled? What is veiling him? This is interesting because it's very clearly laid out in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 7 through 18, which I'll read in a moment, but it's laid out in this passage that the old covenant, the covenant made with Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai, actually veiled Jesus. It was actually a veil that kept them from seeing him clearly. So it says here, uh, we'll start in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, therefore since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his, fight, over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away, but their minds were made dull. For to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. So the Old Covenant was veiling them. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. He is unveiled. It's the same word in the Greek. The apocalypsis is the same word here. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled or apocalypsis faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. That is the picture of what was veiling Jesus is the law. The Old Covenant was a veil that hindered them from seeing. As long as the temple stood in Jerusalem, sacrifices continued, the law was being followed, as long as that was going on, there was a veil that hindered people from stepping into the New Covenant of Jesus Christ. Once the Old Covenant was removed entirely by the destruction of the temple, it could be clearly seen, and there was no distraction of the Old Covenant because it had been completely abolished and annihilated. This is actually predicted in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, where it says the New Covenant has made the Old obsolete and outdated and soon to fade away. How did it fade away? How did it disappear? How did it pass? by the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. So according to Hebrews 8.13, they were waiting. The old had been made obsolete. God had put the void stamp on the old covenant. I am not honoring this anymore with you, but the old still existed and it veiled them from seeing Jesus properly until the time when it passed away. This is also the picture we see in Galatians chapter 4, where Paul is talking about there are two covenants, and he says there's the covenant of the two mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. He uses the heavenly Jerusalem for the new covenant and the old Jerusalem, the earthly one, to represent the old covenant. He also talks about Sarah being the, the covenant mother who is the one who brings forth Isaac, and the old covenant mother being Hagar, who brings forth Ishmael. And he's drawing all these pictures, and Paul's conclusion at the end of Galatians chapter 4, throw out the old covenant. He says, throw out that bond woman, that slave woman, and her son. Kick it out. And Paul is trying to get them to kick out the old covenant. Well, one last thing before I finish. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, there's a statement and it's sort of a parallel of Revelation 22. So often there's, there's a, a quick response that people have when they hear that the book of Revelation was actually about the 70 AD destruction. The concern is, well, you're taking away from the book of Revelation 
or you're adding to the book of Revelation, which means there are curses that are going to be put on you. Let's back up for a minute. By properly interpreting something, it doesn't mean that we're adding to or taking away from. We're properly interpreting it. It's very different. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Now, that sounds eerily familiar to the Revelation chapter 22 where it says if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. By properly interpreting it, we're not taking away from or adding to, we're properly interpreting it. Those are very different. What happens here, Deuteronomy is the book of the law of the Old Covenant. That's why there's a parallel with the book of Revelation, which is the book of the New Covenant. The book of the New Covenant is the book of Revelation because it shows the passing of the old and the institution of the new. It shows the establishment fully of the new heaven, the new Jerusalem, the new earth. Thank you so much for joining me in this series. I hope it's been helpful. And if you want to read the actual book, all I've really covered so much so far is the first few chapters of introduction. So there's a lot more content in the Art of Revelation, which is inside of Raptureless Second Edition. Thank you so much for joining me.